let's go back to the 1960s, in the setting of Thailand. An actor named Mit Chai Ban Cha was often regarded as an icon of the country's cinematic golden age, Pichara Chawrata, who was also considered to be an icon in Thailand's cinematic golden age. They appeared in the film The Love Diary of Pinchawi. The film received great praise and luckily for the fans, this was just the beginning of one of the most celebrated partnerships in Thai cinematic history as the duo would go on to appear in 165 other films together from the 1960s to the 1970s. However, it was during 1970 that Mitt's career came to an end and so would his life. At the time, Mitt would produce and direct his own film for the very first time as he starred his own iconic character, the Red Eagle, who was a masked crime fighter. Everything was going alright until the film's final scene. In this particular scene, Mitt would fly off into the sunset in a helicopter after defeating the villains. This was meant to be his moment, his prime time, but sadly, things went horribly wrong. As the camera was rolling, Mitt leapt from the ground to grab a rope ladder hanging from the helicopter, but he only managed to reach the lowest rung. The helicopter operator wasn't aware what just happened and continued to fly higher, higher, and higher, to the point where Mitt lost his grip and fell to the ground, leading to his death. This was entirely caught on camera and for obvious reasons, the fatal fall was removed from the DVD versions of the film. But for some other reason, the uncut footage was left in the theatrical release. In the DVD version, the scene ends off with him flying off into the distance and on-screen text paying tribute to the star. Since then, no found footage of Mitt falling was ever released. This is Artem Senna who was a Brazilian race driver that had managed to make a respectable name for himself throughout his career. In total, he won three Formula 1 World Drivers Championships in his career, and was one of the most recognized F1 drivers during his time period, as he also drove for the McLaren. It was at this point that Aiton Senna wanted to achieve more out of his career. He was striving to get that fourth championship and was eager to do anything. Unfortunately, during one of his races for the 1994 Formula 1 San Marino Grand Prix, he crashed into an unprotected concrete barrier. At the time of the crash, Artin was driving a Williams FW16 and was midway through his seventh lap. As he was approaching the corner, he lost control of the car and crashed into the barrier at a speed of 130 miles per hour. The car's front wheel entered the cockpit and struck through the right frontal area of his helmet. The impact was so strong, it forced his head back into the headrest, which of course caused numerous fractures. On top of this, a piece of the wheel suspension was detached and penetrated into his helmet, causing fatal head trauma and eventually, these tragic injuries led to his death. Now technically there is footage of the event happening and even including his point of impact, but it was deemed at first that there were no close-up pictures of Orton's body. However, one of the known cameramen already situated at the corner was one of the first responders to the scene of the crash. His name is Angelo Orsi who was the picture editor of Italian racing magazine Autosprint. Not only that, but he was a close friend of Senna. In a biography written about Artin Senna, Angelo admitted to taking close-up pics of Senna while he was motionless, after his helmet was removed, and when he was treated by medical personnel on the ground. As expected, those who have seen the pictures have described it as being heavily graphic in nature. Put in perspective, over 4.5 liters of blood was lost and he suffered from a burst temporal artery. Later that night, Angelo would analyze the pictures, and he came to the conclusion that he would never show these pictures to the public. Eventually, one of the commentators for the race, Galvo Bueno, informed Artin's family members and his girlfriend of the photo's existence as he witnessed them being taken. They requested that Angelo Orsi would never allow anyone else to view the photos, and till this day, no photos have ever been leaked. Imagine your day-to-day -day life being recorded without you even knowing by a person that you also don't even know and for your daily actions to be turned into an experimental film. Well that's exactly what the Paramount film is all about. The director of the film, Giannis Kokolis, was inspired to make a cinematic experiment and so he chose an unknown man at the time to be his actor. It was truly never determined on why this particular man was chosen to be the actor it has been suggested that since the man worked for the public power corporation in Greece, which is a power electronic company, Giannis wanted to get some insider information on the business. So you may be wondering, how did this even work in the first place? So let's just go over his script and his plan. To get a hold of the man, 
Yanif would hire a bunch of paid actors to help him. One of the first actors was a woman named Maria Aliferi, who at the time wasn't a famous actor yet and this was one of her first film appearances so definitely not the best way to start. However, after she learned what she was getting herself into, she decided to opt out as she didn't want to get into legal trouble. You see, I mentioned legal trouble because Giannis had a particular plot that he wanted to follow, and let's just say that it's pretty psychotic. He would go on to search for another woman to take the role and unexpectedly, he found someone. As described by Giannis, he told her that she would have to introduce herself as a wife of a rich man who owned a rubber plantation in Africa. She would also have her own false identity in case she ever got caught. The woman would also have to despise her relationship with her husband as he had a disability and could no longer run the plantation. Now after she explained everything that Giannis told her to tell him, he was pretty suspicious about everything and was weirded out. But don't worry, Giannis was steps ahead. He had already hired another actor who pretended to have a disability and was in a wheelchair. So the woman told him that they would go back to their place to prove it and to his surprise, there was her husband. After a bit of talking and getting to know each other, her husband liked his attitude and offered him a job at his business. But before he even had the opportunity, he would be lured away by his wife to go on a romantic walk. As we go on, you're going to realize how many turns and changes of events this whole movie has and honestly, I could barely keep up with it just by reading the script that it was given. It was at this point that she still had to play the role of an unhappy wife. So she kept in contact with the man and asked him if he was interested in coming over to her house and that her husband was away so he wouldn't even know. He of course accepted the request just because he wanted some play. Oh yeah, by the way, I'm gonna be referring the man, like the one who's being recorded and doesn't even know, as just the man. Because when I was looking for any sort of name, the only thing I saw was that there was like an initial that said VK. But I'm not even sure if this was accurate because the articles I've seen were all in Greece. So just to keep things simple, he's just going to be referred to as the man or the unknown man. When the unknown man entered her house, they went straight to the bedroom, but before anything else could happen, two policemen, an investigator, and a secretary abruptly entered the bedroom. The man is interrogated by the officers and gets accused of adultery. Slowly, however, the interrogation quickly changes from the topic of adultery to the man now being asked political questions and who still worked with him in the PPC. But they wanted even more out of him. Later on, the husband, who was escorted by a fake policeman and a district attorney, asked him to confess his contacts with foreign organizations, and if he didn't, they threatened to charge him with treason. Shortly after, the interrogation would be over, and the man was released. To which he never saw the woman ever again, or anyone else on the film. It was stated in one of the articles, however, that there was actually meant to be a mock execution scene. This would take place in a deserted location and involve the husband and the unknown man. But even this was too cruel for Giannis and the actors as they didn't want to go through with it. So after that, the entire film was over. Now at this point, you would think that the film just took over a couple days or like even a week or two, you know, nothing too serious. Well, this actually went on for two months. If you didn't feel bad for this guy at this point, I mean, it's two months of being recorded and not even knowing what's happening, just the weirdest people coming at you and having the most questionable, like, interactions, it's... He was going through a lot. So once the film was officially over, Giannis came clean and told the man what just happened. On top of this, he told the man that if he told anyone about this, he would be executed. Yeah, Giannis may have not been the smartest person in the room. To no one's surprise, the man told one of his buddies about what just happened and the police were quickly informed. This film's documentations were brought up into court and Giannis ended up admitting to what he had done. In the end, the film was never shown to the public, but it did manage to become well known at the time due to the press constantly talking about it. For his actions, Giannis Kokolis was sentenced to 16 months in prison, but would shortly be appealed and eventually released. Oddly enough, the actors in the film weren't ever caught, and no possible connections to their identities were ever made. Currently, the film is listed in Greece's cinema records and has been kept away from the public eye as it's considered banned content. So that was a lot to take in. As stated before, finding information for this film was honestly horrendous since everything was in Greek. So just having to translate everything from Greek and there was one article actually that did have more detail of the entire case. And when I tried looking through it, it apparently wasn't archived or anything. So 
who knows maybe in the future it may end up working one day or just more information gets passed on in june 2021 anonymous redditor 39 would post on a non-murder mystery subreddit asking if anyone recognizes a creepy ad that they remember that aired in the early 2000s the op states when i was a kid i saw this creepy advert on tv I only ever saw it once and ever since I saw it, I always wondered what it was trying to advertise and who made it. I remember that the advertisement started off with a home video of a young girl running around in a field of daisies and maybe blowing on a dandelion. Her mother may have also been sitting on the grass with the girl. The footage is quite old and potentially in black and white. They then compare it to another ad known as Daisy that was from 1964. Over the top, the song Whatever Will Be Will Be by Doris Day is playing. Then there's a picture of the little girl which slowly morphs into a woman as she grows up. The picture of the woman then transforms into an ill-looking, bruised woman whose facial features have been damaged from drugs. At the end, a clanging sound can be heard as jail bars then appear over the image and the song fades out. The advert appeared approximately between 2003 and 2010 in England. After speculation, it was suggested that it was either a crime prevention PSA or a drug prevention PSA to which a lot of people are leaning more towards the drug prevention PSA. The only problem with this is that there's literally so many anti-drug PSAs out there, so this wasn't going to be an easy search. However, there is some hope as multiple people in the thread do recall this PSA. And just like that, an update regarding the search was already in. One of the searchers, Into the Bounding Main, made a recreation of the PSA based off of OP's description. As a last attempt to garner even more attention, OP posted on the r slash askuk subreddit as it was the only place they haven't posted on yet. They were luckily directed by another user to a creepy version of the song by Pink Martini, which was released in 1997. The OP believed that this version of the song was the exact one used in the PSA, as it perfectly fit with the tone of the commercial. But ever since this post from 2 years ago, there hasn't been any discovery. The latest update that I could find regarding the search was from a month ago when user geologist every 6393 commented on the thread saying that they remember the PSA and how it was also played in the US and aired on UPN. They further explained that they recall seeing it around 2007 to 2008, but that it could have also been shown on other broadcasts such as WBCW and MTV. In their last statement, they announced that they have contacted both the US Ad Council in partnership to end addiction. Finding PSAs are definitely a challenge, especially when there's so many adverts on the same topic. When it comes to anti-drug campaigns, there's so many out there. But you know what, the lost media community finds so much that I wouldn't be surprised if they somehow managed to find this one. Alright guys, this is a new day. There was an update that I forgot to tell you guys about, so I'm gonna just quickly explain it because I don't know how, but I completely missed it. So there's still a bunch of people who have claimed to see the K Sarah Sarah ad. But they don't remember it being a PSA, instead they remember it being a promo for a true crime documentary. These are just a couple of the comments and with the search for K Sarah Sarah still being a mystery, this could potentially be a lead. The last piece of media we'll be looking into is a supposed Filipino anti-drug PSA known as Shabu. And I say supposed because there's only a couple eyewitnesses who remember seeing it. Also, the ad's official title is not actually Shabu. The word Shabu is Filipino slang for the word methamphetamine. These people asked around on Facebook and Reddit to ask anyone if they've ever seen it. 
As claimed, the commercial starts off with a black background and a white human-shaped cutout made out of styrofoam. The cutout slowly dissolves from the liquid dropping from above, as it's supposedly an acid. After the figure fully dissolves, the word Shabu is shown above it, while the background music builds up. It was also noted that there was no voiceover over the ad. According to eyewitnesses, the PSA also aired only on the television and radio broadcast IBC 13. While a majority of those who have seen it have stated that it aired throughout the late 80s and 1990s, there has been one eyewitness that claimed that the PSA occurred from 1986 to 1987. So as you can see, it's all over the place. The only piece of media regarding this PSA is a recreation that someone made. If I honestly wanted to, I could make a whole video dedicated to Filipino lost media, especially for PSAs. While doing research for this video, there were so many PSAs that I could have mentioned, but most of them were lost causes, and I mean, to be honest, this one might be a lost cause, but at least there was a recreation for it. But for now, it's safe to say that this is either still lost, or it just doesn't exist. If you made it to this point in the video, I greatly appreciate you watching. So, as expected, I'm gonna continue this series, and honestly, I'm trying my best to find stuff that people haven't talked about. If you're new to this series, these Lost Media Deep Dive will be monthly videos, so if you enjoyed this video, maybe you'll stick around for a next month's upload. Also, I already know I made a community post about this, but I want to thank you guys for getting me the 50,000 subs. That's kind of insane. Not kind of, it is insane. It's a major milestone for me, and I never expected to gain that much so quickly in just three years. I've only been making videos for three years, so honestly, thank you guys. Uh, feel free to leave any comments on what you thought about the video down below. If you have any requests for lost media topics or just for any video topic in general, you know what to do. But yeah, that ends it off for today's video. As always, thank you guys for watching and have a great one. But before you leave, I seriously hope you do have a great one.